Hi everyone, David Packer here, and in this video I would like to discuss details of flying to space. Specifically, I would like to fi fill in some details that were left out of previous uh, videos. I would like to discuss in more detail what are the different parts of a rocket, a typical mission profile, and also details about engineering of rocket engines, as opposed to the physics and science of rocket engines. We are going to start by looking at the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. The reason for this choice is because it's a relatively simple rocket, and therefore it will have fewer parts to try to understand. Uh, after that we will also take a look at more complex rockets like the Space Shuttle. Ok, let's go ahead and take a look at the parts of the Falcon 9 rocket. On the left here we have a schematic diagram from SpaceX, and on the right is an image of the, uh, of the vehicle being put together. Ok, let's start with the spaceship. Here is a spaceship, this is a Crew Dragon. Uh, this one uh, is actually uh, uh, from Demo 1 mission, it flew without astronauts as a test flight. The, uh, the cargo, or the spaceship in this case, goes at the very top of the rocket, so it replaces the bus. Next, we have the second stage, which is right here in the image. And in the vehicle assembly building, here is the second stage. So here are the tanks, and right here, this is the second stage rocket engine, the Merlin vacuum engine. And finally, we have the first stage. This is the first stage, this whole thing. And here we see the first stage in the assembly building. At the very top of the first stage, is the so-called interstage, this is this black tube here, and this basically provides a spacing between the first stage and the second stage. And in case of the Falcon 9 rocket, the interstage remains attached to the first stage and they appear to land together. And just to give you a scale of how big these things are, here are some people working on the rocket. The people appear to be quite small. Okay, now let's go ahead and take a closer look at what uh, what are the components of each stage? Most of the sp uh, space in each stage is taken up by the liquid oxygen or LOX tank and the fuel tank. In case of uh, the Falcon 9 rocket, uh, the fuel is RP-1. Here's a picture of RP-1 from, uh, from Wikipedia. Um, RP-1 is, uh, uh, is basically a super refined kerosene, which is kind of like diesel fuel. And it's used because it is pretty energy dense, and it's also easy to handle. It's liquid at, uh, at room temperature, um, although I think SpaceX actually cools their fuel to increase its density a little bit. The oxidizer is liquid oxygen. Here is a picture of liquid oxygen. Uh, liquid oxygen is a cryogenic liquid. It has to be kept at a temperature of below minus 183 Celsius, or about minus 300 um, Fahrenheit, and that is its boiling temperature. So the uh, oxygen in the rocket certainly has to be colder than minus 183. Now, in addition to the two tanks, there is there are the rocket engines. So for example, uh, on the Falcon 9, there are nine rockets. Uh, nine rocket engines on the first stage, and hence the rocket is called Falcon 9. There is also a bunch of plumbing. Fuel, uh, both oxygen and fuel have to get from the tanks to the engines. So one part of the plumbing you can see right here in the middle, there is a liquid oxygen line that runs through the middle of the fuel tank to bring the oxygen to the engines. The second stage is much the same. There is, uh, again, a liquid oxygen tank and a fuel tank and a bunch of plumbing to bring the fuel to the engine. Now, if you compare the engines on the first stage and the second stage, the engine on the second stage looks a lot bigger than the engine on the first, than the engines on the first stage. And the reason for this is that the engine on the second stage uh, operates only in vacuum, while the engines on the first stage over here have to operate both at, uh, at sea level pressure and in vacuum. Now, at sea level pressure, the engines can't, um, the gas escaping the engines can't be at pressure lower than sea level pressure, and hence the engines can't expand the gases so much. 
and uh, the expansion nozzle is not too big. On the other hand, when operating in vacuum, the gases can be expanded a lot more, bringing them to lower pressure, but also um, extracting uh, more, uh, um, more of their thermal energy and converting it into kinetic energy of the exhaust gas. And that is why the, uh, the engine nozzle on the second stage is so much bigger, since it doesn't have to, uh, doesn't have to operate at atmospheric pressure. A quick digression about liquid oxygen. You might have been wondering what is this banner image that is on our YouTube website. Well, this is a setup to liquefy oxygen. Right here is the top of a gaseous oxygen cylinder. In this styrofoam cup is liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen is pretty cold. And you see that inside liquid nitrogen, there is this copper tube wound around another styrofoam core. So what we're doing is we're taking uh, gaseous oxygen from, uh, from, uh, from here, passing it through a regulator, and then goes through this tube into the copper tube, and then around this, um, this spiral inside the uh, liquid nitrogen, and then out it comes into this beaker right here. Now, what's the idea? The idea is as the gaseous oxygen goes through the spiral tube, the, uh, the oxygen gets cooled down by the liquid nitrogen that surrounds it, and that cools uh, the oxygen below its liquefaction point. So what comes out this tube is not gaseous oxygen, but liquid oxygen. And in this beaker, we go ahead and collect a little bit of liquid oxygen to do um, basically experiments with fire. Um, and uh, yeah, if we ever get together, uh, I will for sure do this experiment for you and show you just how flammable liquid oxygen makes stuff. Okay, now that we understand what are the parts that make up a rocket, let's take a look at a typical mission profile. And this is pulled out of the SpaceX Falcon's, uh, Falcon rocket user's guide. The rocket starts out here on the launch pad. The first stage ignites and pushes the rocket upwards. The first stage pushes the rocket up through the dense lower atmosphere, and then the rocket tilts over and starts flying downrange while continuing to, continuing to ascend to climb higher. The first stage uh, pushes the rocket all the way to the Kármán line. It also accelerates the rocket to roughly one third of its orbital velocity. Um, once this point is reached, the uh, fuel and oxidizer in the first stage are exhausted, and the first stage separates from the second stage. Throwing away the first stage is actually crucial to rocket performance. Right? By the time the fuel and oxygen tank in the first stage are uh, depleted, uh, the first stage is just dead mass. And of course, dead mass hurts acceleration, as we know from Newton's second law, and therefore it makes sense to get rid of it. Now the second stage starts out already going pretty fast, and it can have enough impulse to push itself all the way to orbital velocity. Uh, the second stage ignites, and it continues pushing the payload up into space and up to, um, up to uh, orbital velocity. So here we see the uh, second stage continuing to accelerate. At this point, the uh, fairing, which was protecting the payload from the atmosphere, separates, because once we're in vacuum of space, the fairing is just dead weight, and the fairing falls away to the Earth, and second stage continues burning, pushing the payload all the way up into space and all the way to orbital velocity. Once orbital velocity is reached, and the fuel in the second stage is exhausted, uh, the second stage separates from the payload, and the payload is let go into its orbit. Typically, the second stage also turns around and deorbits. Um, in case of Falcon 9, this is a really special rocket, because its first stage does this flip maneuver, and then it fires its engine with just a little bit of fuel that it has left, which causes it to slow down and re-enter the atmosphere. Here it deploys what are called grid fins, which are basically 
aerodynamic devices to help steer the rocket inside the atmosphere. Uh, it does a little bit uh, of another burn to help it re-enter the atmosphere without burning up. And then it flies itself down and it lands on this uh, uh, rocket landing platform out in the ocean. Now, how does the uh, Falcon 9 compare to other rockets? Let's go ahead and compare it to the Space Shuttle. So here we have a picture of the Space Shuttle and its mission profile. Uh, the Space Shuttle is basically composed of three parts. We have the Shuttle Orbiter, that's the part that looks like an airplane. The main tank, that's the orange part right here, and the two solid rocket boosters. At launch, the solid rocket boosters ignite, and also the, uh, the Space Shuttle main engines on the Space Shuttle Orbiter ignite. The main engines actually don't use the uh, fuel inside the Space Shuttle. The fuel is inside the big orange fuel tank, and it flows through the Space Shuttle into the main engines. The boosters are like a first stage on the Falcon 9. They help to push the Space Shuttle up and accelerate it part way to, uh, to orbital velocity. Some way into the flight, the, space, uh, the solid rocket boosters are exhausted, all the fuel inside of them is burned, and they separate from the Space Shuttle, and then they here is shown as they fall away, and they parachute into the uh, Atlantic Ocean where they're picked up, uh, refurbished, and reused. The space shuttle and the main tank continue on to orbit. Once orbit is uh, essentially reached, and the fuel inside the, the fuel and oxy oxygen inside the main tank are exhausted, the main tank separates from the space shuttle, and it re-enters the Earth's atmosphere and burns up. The space shuttle does a little bit of an engine burn, to insert itself all the way into orbit, and then it flies in orbit, performing its on-orbit uh, operations. Finally, when the space shuttle is ready to return to the Earth, it does a deorbit burn, it orients its engines in the direction of motion, and fires them to slow itself down. Uh, then it basically air breaks, aero breaks in the atmosphere, as shown here. So it re-enters the atmosphere, and it does a uh, not a ballistic re-entry, it does a lifting re-entry. So uh, it has pretty benign g-forces when it's re-entering the atmosphere because it's basically flying, it's producing lift, and it's able to keep itself in the, uh, in the less dense upper atmosphere for longer. Finally, once it has slowed down enough, it, uh, it glides down like a, like a glider, and it lands on a runway, as shown here. Now, by comparison to the um, uh, Falcon 9 vehicle, the Space Shuttle is a bit more complicated because it has uh, both solid and liquid propellants and also the engines of the second stage, which is basically the Space Shuttle Orbiter, uh, go all the way into space and then land together with the Space Shuttle. And uh, Actually, the complexity is probably what doomed this project, right? The Space Shuttle has excellent performance, but it's also an extremely complicated system. Um, and it turns out that it was just not cost-efficient to fly the Space Shuttle, because all this complexity required lots of maintenance, which made it extremely expensive to fly the Space Shuttle. The complexity, in a way, also made the Space Shuttle uh, rather unsafe, and we're going to discuss that in a special lecture on engineering ethics. Now let's go ahead and take a little bit of a deeper look at rocket engines. What are the three functions of rocket engines? Well, first, they have to pump the fuel and oxygen into the combustion chamber. The second, they need to burn the fuel and oxygen to make hot gases. And third, they need to convert hard, these hot gases into thrust, and that they do inside the nozzle. Now the picture on the right shows the rocket ion F1 engine, which was the mighty engine that powered the Saturn V rocket, the first stage of it, and that's of course the rocket that took the astronauts to the moon. How do, uh, how do rocket engines pump the fuel and oxidizer into the engine? 
but there are various different strategies and perhaps the simplest strategy are the so-called open cycle engines. How do open cycle engines work? Well, let's take a look. So here is a nice diagram from this Everyday Astronaut website. And here we have the fuel and the oxidizer. And uh, our goal is to take these two and pump them at high pressure into the combustion chamber. Now over here, we have these two pumps, one pump for the oxidizer and one pump for, for the fuel. Now, how are we going to power the pumps? Well, we're going to divert a little bit of the oxygen and a little bit of the fuel into a little turbo, uh, turbine engine right here. And this turbine engine, this is basically like an airplane or a helicopter engine, is going to burn the oxygen and the fuel. It's going to produce power, which is going to use to turn the two pumps. Uh, now, why this is called an open cycle engine? It's basically because the exhaust from our uh, turbine engine just gets dumped overboard and expelled out without making much thrust. And indeed, SpaceX uses exactly this kind of engine on its Falcon 9 rocket. So if you take a look at, uh, at the test stand, here's a picture of a, uh, uh, of a Merlin engine being tested. This right here is a main engine nozzle. This is the engine, so somewhere inside there are the pumps and the little turbine engine. And what you see right here is the exhaust out of the turbine engine. This black smoke is the exhaust coming out and it's just being dumped overboard. Now you might ask, why is the exhaust coming out of the little turbine engine black? And that is because it's not been, uh, being run at stoichio stoichiometric ratio. It uses more fuel than it should. Why would you want to use more fuel than, uh, than you should? Well, that makes the combustion uh, less hot and, uh, and that saves the turbine blades right here. So basically, by not running the optimal ratio of fuel to oxidizer, the burning inside the little turbine engine is not as good. And that is a good thing because that means that the turbine doesn't overheat and melt. Of course, uh, being an open cycle engine, this engine is, uh, doesn't achieve maximum efficiency. And that is because the exhaust out of the turbine is not, uh, is not generating thrust. How can we improve on an open cycle engine? And that's of course to make a closed cycle engine. What is the difference? Well, in a closed cycle engine, the exhaust out of the little turbine engine is not uh, exhausted overboard, it goes right into the combustion chamber, right? And that way it can go through the combustion chamber and through the engine nozzle and produce thrust. Now, both the space shuttle main engine and some Soviet engines are exactly this kind of engine. For example, here is a Energomarsh RD-180 engine on a test stand. Now, this engine is actually used not by not just by uh, Soviet or Russian rockets. It's also used by the Americans on the Atlas V rocket. It is a really good engine, it has uh, very high performance. Now, one of the key difficulties in building a closed cycle engine is what to do with the turbine. Here is a problem. The turbine needs to operate at kind of lower temperature so it does not melt. And therefore, one has to use a mixture of oxidizer and fuel, which is not optimal. Now, the Russians chose to use more oxidizer, while Americans chose to use more fuel. Uh, why do you make one choice versus the other? Well, if you, make, uh, if you use more oxidizer, the temperature uh, inside the turbine, little turbine engine will be lower, but the environment will be extremely corrosive. How did the Russians solve this problem? Well, they developed special alloys, uh, which, uh, uh, which basically were uh, corrosion resistant and were able to survive this oxygen rich environment. On the, other way, on the other hand, how did the Americans solve this problem when they had more fuel going into the, into the little turbine? Well, the problem with having too much fuel going into the turbine is it produces soot and, uh, and soot depositing on the turbine 
um, uh, and also getting inject injected into the combustion chamber is bad because it clogs up the engine. And the Americans basically solved this by using hydrogen, uh, hydrogen, uh, liquid hydrogen as a fuel, and when burning liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, no soot is produced. Both the American approach of using a fuel-rich turbine engine and the Soviet or Russian approach of using an oxidizer-rich turbine engine work and both increase the overall performance of the rocket engine. Now, one downside of this closed cycle engine approach is that both the oxidizer pump and the fuel pump and the little turbine engine uh, sit, uh, use the same shaft, right? So there is one shaft which connects the little turbine engine to the two pumps. Now, why is this a problem? This is a problem because if there is any leakage, it could be quite dangerous, right? In order for the system to function, uh, to function safely, we need to avoid getting any oxidizer being mixed with any fuel outside of basically the combustion chamber and, and, the, uh, and the turbine engine, right? sorry, and the turbine engine right here. Now, what's the alternative? The alternative is to build a full flow engine. And this is exactly what SpaceX is doing in the Raptor engine. This is uh, the engine that is to be used on Starship Super Heavy, which is uh, the next launch vehicle that those guys are developing. Here is an uh, image of the Raptor under undergoing testing here on Earth in a test stand. Now, how does a full flow engine work? Well, instead of having one turbine which powers uh, two pumps, uh, a full flow engine has two separate turbines powering the two separate pumps. Right, so here is a turbine powering the fuel rich side, so the fuel, uh, the fuel side, and here is a separate turbine, uh, uh, turbine engine powering a pump for the oxidizer. This way, the oxidizer rich stuff stays on one side. The fuel-rich stuff stays on the other side, and there is no possibility for uh, for a leak being dangerous, because even if a leak happens, it stays to either the fuel-rich side or the oxygen-rich side, and therefore um, it doesn't uh, doesn't cause explosions, or at least shouldn't cause explosions. The full-flow engine kind of works on international harmony, as it combines the super alloys developed by the Russians uh, to build a. Uh, Turbines, uh, turbine engines that work in uh, oxidizer-rich environment with American research on by making turbine engines that work in fuel-rich environments. Now, so far, we have concentrated on how to pump the fuel and the oxidizer into the combustion chamber. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at what happens inside the combustion chamber and also in the engine nozzle. Okay, to go ahead and see what happens in combustion chamber and the engine nozzle, I'm actually going to look at some uh, numerical simulations, and they are from this paper right here. Okay, so here is our combustion chamber. Here is the converging and diverging nozzle. Now, what's going on here? Well, a lot of things are going on. Number one, we must inject the fuel and the oxidizer into the combustion chamber. This happens at this injector face plate. Now we must extract as much chemical energy as possible from the fuel and oxygen, which means that we have to have good atomization and mixing. Right? That means that the stream of liquid oxygen and the fuel have to uh, uh, have to be separated into tiny tiny droplets which are here and they have to be well mixed together and if they're well mixed together then when they start burning they will burn pretty well and um, and completely extracting as much chemical energy out of out of the fuel and oxygen as possible and that's what happens in this rapid combustion zone right over here Uh, now, our next goal is uh, to avoid uh, melting the engine, right? We want to avoid two things. We want to avoid burning away the injector plate, and we also want to avoid burning away the size of the engine. 
So typically the injector plate gets cooled uh, typically with fuel as opposed to the oxygen. And that is so it doesn't get too hot and start melting. Also the injector plate is set up so that the burning doesn't happen right at the face of the injector plate. It happens a little bit away. And to do this, the mixing happens not right at the face, but the, basically the idea is to inject, um, inject the oxygen and the fuel. So the mixing happens uh, out here in, uh, in the area of the rapid combustion. Right. If we back away towards the injector plate, the, the fuel streams are separate uh, from, the, um, from the oxidizer streams and hence they don't burn very well. They only start burning when the two streams mix together uh, in what's labeled the rapid combustion zone over here. Now, in order to cool the sides of the engine, uh, often uh, there is a regenerative cooling. So that means the fuel is passed along the channels uh, in channels along the sides of the engine. And uh, basically the cold fuel takes away some of the heat that is being generated inside the engine. And over, over here is kind of a diagram of what's happening on the wall right there, right? So outer portion, this is where the coolant or the cold fuel is flowing. Then there is a chamber wall. And then there is this uh, TBC and or soot layer. And finally the combustion gases. Now what is this intermediate layer? Well, uh, oftentimes rocket engines are set up so that injectors near the edge inject too much fuel and not enough oxygen. Why is this good? This is good because uh, the combustion near the edge of the engine is incomplete and therefore it's colder. So the gases which are traveling along the, uh, the edge of the engine are, uh, are colder and hence the engine wall doesn't get heated up as much. Now finally, it is essential to avoid the so-called combustion instability. And this combustion instability um, actually plagued the, uh, the F1 engines that powered the, um, uh, the Saturn V rocket that went to the moon. There is a really cool YouTube video about combustion instability, and I suggest that you go ahead and take a look at it. Okay, now let's go ahead and take a look at how heat energy gets converted into kinetic energy of the exhaust gases. So here is a numerical simulation of the flow inside the rocket engine. In the top half of the simulation is shown the temperature. So here is a temperature color scale going from 1200 uh, degrees Kelvin all the way to 3600 degrees Kelvin. On the bottom here is shown the Mach number or the velocity of the gases um, in relation to the speed of sound. So when the Mach number is one right over here, that means the gases are moving at exactly the speed of sound. And what we have here is a converging diverging nozzle. So we see that our nozzle first converges, it gets narrower and then it has a throat and then it starts diverging and getting wider and wider and wider. Now, how does this nozzle work? Well, first let's take a look at the converging part. So as the nozzle narrows, the flow speeds up. Uh, and we see this by looking at these lines. We see that gas goes from moving slower than the speed of sound here to moving at the speed of sound right here at the narrowest point of the nozzle. Now, why does this happen? This is basically the garden hose effect. If you have a garden hose and you put your finger over it, you constrict the opening. Now the flow is still the same. And if the flow has to be the same, but it's flowing through a smaller opening, the flow has to go faster. That's exactly what happens in, in the garden hose. And this, is exact, and this is also what's happening in this rocket engine. Now you might ask, why not keep constricting the opening to speed up the flow even more? It turns out that does not work at supersonic velocities. If you keep narrowing down the opening, 
then uh, instead of uh, getting the, the flow to be higher, you basically just block off the opening and the flow stops. Uh, this is called choking. So once the flow speeds up to supersonic regime, what happens is that the nozzle starts opening up again. Now as the nozzle opens up, the gases start expanding. And as they expand, they cool. So here we see that we go from 3600 degrees down to uh, about 2000 degrees and even colder. Now as the gas expands uh, and cools, it's basically it's uh, heat energy, that's the temperature, is getting converted into kinetic energy. And we can see this as the gas is accelerating, right? It gets accelerated from Mach 1 over here all the way up to Mach 3.7 right here at the exit of the nozzle. So we basically this, uh, this engine nozzle took a gas which was moving at uh, 7 tenth the speed of sound and accelerated it all the way up to 3.7 times the speed of sound. Now another cool thing you can see in the simulation is the uh, cooling along the engine walls. So you see over here extra fuel is being injected and this fuel causes the burning near the engine wall to, to happen at lower temperature. And you see this cold film of, uh, of burning gas uh, traveling all the way along the engine wall and out into the nozzle. I hope that uh, taking a look at the simulation of flows inside rocket engines demystifies a little bit of how rocket engines convert thermal energy into kinetic energy of the exhaust gases. So far, the concepts that we discussed seem pretty straightforward. Here we have Werner von Braun, who is a German scientist that came over to United States at the end of uh, World War II, and he helped uh, the Americans develop their space program. Uh, here he is standing at the business end of a Saturn V rocket, showing the Rocketdyne F1 engines. Now, the uh, reasonably straightforward concepts that we described get translated into rather complex engineering. So maybe the engines look not too terrible on this photo, but when we look at the engine documentation, it turns out that it's quite complex indeed. Here is a schematic of the Rocketdyne F1 engine. And frankly, I can't make heads or tails of the schematic. Although the science concepts that go into building rocket engines are reasonably straightforward, the actual engineering design is not so easy. And that is really why it's called rocket science. I hope you enjoyed this video and remember to stay curious.